Genesis chapter 22 tonight, and looking forward to what God has for us this evening. Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to begin in verse uh, number 1. Genesis 22, and we're going to begin in verse number 1. And let's stand together, we'll read the first uh, few verses of this chapter together. Genesis 22, if you're able to do so, stand out of respect for the Word of God. And let's begin in verse number one. And just by way of reminder, we've been looking at the names of God, and many of you have shared just things God's been teaching you and remind you of, maybe revealing to you for the first time, and we're looking at another name tonight, been looking forward to our study. Verse one says this, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee in the land of Moriah. And notice these words. Imagine if you heard these for the first time, the following command. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Verse 3, And Abraham rose up early, that's striking, in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac, verse 7, spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, verse 8, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called on him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Can you imagine the, the relief of those words? Verse 12, and he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns, and Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead, in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. So tonight we want to look at this name. It's a compound name. We've already studied about Jehovah, and tonight looking at Jehovah Jireh. What does Jehovah do in our text tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, thank you for the joy it is to gather tonight to study your word. Thank you for the reminder that your name is wonderful, that Lord, uh, your name is glorious, and someday, Lord, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And Father, we know that names matter to you, and we thank you for this name that's been given to us in this chapter tonight. I pray you'd help us to study it and to succinctly present to uh, each person here tonight, Lord, uh, the truths in it and the precious relational benefits that it has in our fellowship with you. Bless our study tonight, be honored in how it's preached, how it's heard, and how each of us live it out this week. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, if you were in the service this morning, um, you caught the little reference to uh, Socks, remember me talking about that this morning? Some of you, that was the only thing you got out of the message, uh, was the fact that socks tend to have a toe memory, you know, where if you wear a sock, a sock on your right foot, the big toe start, starts kind of reforming a sock, and same with the left, and if you switch them, if you really got them formed well, it's pretty uncomfortable to wear them on the wrong foot. And tonight when I walked in, Brother Joe, I don't think he minds me mentioning, he, thankfully he has these in a Ziploc bag, okay? Otherwise I may be holding my nose right now. Brother Joe brought in some of his socks, and on them, for us OCD people, there's a little R on the one, and there's a little L on the other, so I'm not the only weird one. Some of you looked at me like, I've never thought of that before, you're, you're strange. So Brother Joe, I don't know if that's good for you, brother, to be in the same category as me, but, but toe memory. The other day I saw a statement, someone said this, I wish that my, 
my bank account would replenish as quickly as my laundry baskets do. You know, my, if for you ladies especially, that resonates with you. My wife, if she doesn't do three loads a day, we're losing ground. That just, that's our house where we're at right now. And, and, and just this idea of replenishing. An amazing socks go into a dryer and, and they become orphans when they come out. I don't, I don't get that, but it just, we have less as we go through life. And tonight we want to look at this aspect of God, that God is, the, the idea of Jehovah Jireh is that He is our provider. He's the one who meets our needs. He's the one who, in a moment like this, met a need that desperately was needed, uh, this situation where God needed to intervene. And so tonight we want to look at the first compound name of God, which is Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Now the question tonight is this, how do we experience, how do we receive, and how do we appreciate God who is a spirit, God who is not touchable, doing tangible, provisional kind of things in our lives? Where do we look? How do we see it? How do we appreciate it? And how do we respond in a way that pleases and honors Him? And so we want to talk about tonight two human needs that God meets, that God provides for, that only God can provide for as found in our text. First of all, number one, God provides for us in the midst of all that we have going on, provision in the trials that come into our lives. The trials. And you notice in verse number one that it says God did tempt um, Abraham. We're not talking about temptation in the sense of trying to lure into evil. James is clear, is it not? God does not tempt it with evil, neither tempteth he any man. We're talking about a testing we're talking about a trial of the purity and the integrity of our faith and our relationship with the Lord. Coming over here tonight, as I mentioned, Pastor Dave and I were at an ordination thing in Mansfield, and I knew my window was tight. Don't ask me how fast I was driving on 30 coming back over here, but I got here on time. And I was at a stoplight in Mansfield. In fact, it's a stoplight that I have sat at for, since I was in high school driving. I went to the Christian school there at the church where I was at tonight. Uh, this afternoon, and I'm sitting at the light. I don't know if you've ever had where you're waiting to turn left, you know, and, and you're, so you're kind of out into traffic, and then it goes to yellow and red, and sometimes if you don't time it right, you don't get turned before the traffic starts. Well, that was me, so what I did, I was out into traffic, I backed up and waited for the light to change again so I could go, and so I'm sitting there, key word, I backed up, and then the light changed, and thankfully, I didn't gun it. I was still in reverse. There was three cars behind me. Everybody was going to be coming to church that knew Harley from years ago, and I would have been sitting there looking like a complete idiot, you know, gunning it as I back up into this pile of traffic. That's not what we're talking about tonight. We're not talking about uh, uh, difficulty or suffering that comes because of our own mistakes. We're talking about God-ordained, allowing into our life things that test us, things that refine us. And God is there in those moments wanting to provide for the needs that we have. Isn't that amazing? God tests us, and yet in the midst of the test, we still get to look to Him to meet our needs. A few things about that I would give you tonight. First of all, number one, God offers to us in the midst of testing tried expectation. Expectations and confidence in God that is tried and found to be worthy of faith and confidence in Him. And so Jehovah Jireh provides for us in the midst of our trials, tried expectation. And I would give you a couple of areas in which God either fulfills or exceeds our expectations in the face of trials. Look at verse number two. God says to him, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, just so there's no confusion, whom thou lovest, Get thee in the land of Moriah, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. What does God do in the midst of trials as Jehovah Jireh? How does he provide for us uh, tried expectation? Number one, first of all, he gives us expectation in the situations of life that seem illogical. Does that make sense to you? We just studied last week about God as Adonai. Do you remember that? And Abraham's still waiting on the sun now that we see referenced in this chapter and he's been waiting forever, and now God says to him, this son that I told you all these promises are connected to, go kill him. Go offer him as a sacrifice. Doesn't that seem a little illogical from a human perspective? And so God is in the midst of the illogical sequences of life. He's confirming, 
Trust me, I'm going to provide. I, I know what I'm doing. And I believe often when things don't make sense is when we lose the presence and provision of God in our lives. Now, I want to ask you a question. And the question is this. What is the question we are most tempted to ask when a trial comes our way? One word of who, what, when, where, or why. Is not why often the question we ask, God, why me? Why now? Why this situation? And the answer to that is God is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider, and He is at work. And even when we don't have an answer for the why, we know who is at work. We know who will provide and who will sustain us through the illogical things of this life. And to be honest with you, I don't know that the painful things are the most difficult to bear, if at least I see the purpose in them. It's sometimes the most minor things that just drive me nuts because there's no reason for them, humanly speaking. And it's as we rest in Jehovah Jireh that we can be faithful in the season of trials that don't make sense. See, Abraham needed Isaac to get the promises and all that God had pro- He needed this kid, and God's saying to sacrifice him. And yet in the midst of that illogical request, Abraham demonstrates faith. I have found this to be true in my life, and those of you who have gone through much more difficult situation than I have can attest to this better than I can, or at some point in your life or future you will. God never wastes pain. He doesn't. The things in your life that are most difficult this evening in your families, in your body, in your heart, and maybe other, some, some other situation or circumstance, God does not waste pain. He's doing something. The things that rip our hearts out, the things that devastate us, there's a divine purpose behind them. And Jehovah Jireh would testify to that truth this evening. Every trial that God allows in our lives has His divine purpose behind it. All right, now second, if you will, (laughs) excuse me, go down to verse number number 5. And I find it striking that Abraham in verses 3 and 4, we won't read them again for sake of time, he doesn't put it off. He doesn't make excuses. I I find that striking. In verse 3, he rises up early in the morning. He's ready and he's prepared to follow through in what God has asked of him. And so there's great expectation and faith on Abraham's part. Now look at verse 5. And Abraham, son of the young man, abide ye here with with the ass, and I, the lad, will go yonder and worship. Notice this next phrase, and come again to you. Skip down to verse number 8. And Abraham said, my son, after the request by Isaac... God will provide himself, notice that, provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Number two, God validates and God tries and reveals to us that our expectation in the impossible situations will turn out in a way that pleases and honors him. The expectation, the faith we exhibit in the face of that which is impossible. There was a story in the news this past week of a, um, a god, so-called a statue. In fact, the name of the statue is Hanuman, and it's a, a god that's a combination of a man and a monkey from Cambodia. And somehow this, this stature, this idol, had been plundered and somehow found its way into, I believe it was the Smithsonian. Um, and over time, they found out where it was supposed to go back to, some temple in Cambodia. And so just this past week, they returned this god uh, to its, quote, rightful place of, of where it should be worshipped and appreciated. Well, what's interesting is they had, this, they had dancers and all this worship and stuff, quote, unquote, being done as this god's being brought back to its place after decades. Um, it had been acquired in 1982, I think, is the last time it was in its proper location. But one of the officials said this, quote, I'm sure that if Hanuman were alive, we would see a smile on his face. If he were alive. And, and, okay, you're saying if your God were alive, he would be smiling right now. Do you follow the sequence? That means your God's dead, all right? And that means people can move him around and against his, quote, wishes, do what they want with him. That's not our God. He's alive, and he offers to us that same life. And Abraham knew at the end, whatever goes down on the mountain, we're going to come back alive because our God is Jehovah. He provides life to us. He sustains us. And that's where our hope should lie tonight in the face of the impossible that God will not fail us to survive and to thrive in his presence. Now, quickly, 
you're in Genesis, go to the book of Hebrews, and let's go inside the head of Abraham. What was he thinking as he piles the wood and as he leads his son, his young, impressionable son, to the mountain and knows we'll what is Bible shortly to come? To Isaac Samuel doesn't know. Chapters. I find it interesting, there's no record in Scripture that Abraham ever even told Sarah about this situation, what all was required. I don't know that maybe he wanted to burden her with it. Maybe he did share with her. But you see no indication of her involvement, which is just interesting. So he's internalizing it, processing it. What is he thinking in the face of that? Well, Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews gives us, <laughs> through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a little more perception or perspective on his thought process. Hebrews 11, and if you would please look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and that he had received the prom- uh, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now notice verse 19. Here's what he's thinking as he's preparing to do just that. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he had received him in a figure. And so Abraham was willing to believe God and trust God that even though he had never seen a resurrection before, that God could somehow resurrect this son. God could revive the means of fulfilling his promises. And he rested and trusted in God in the face of the impossible. Um. It's interesting that really, in some ways, Isaac, as is alluded to there, he came from a dead womb. He came from a man described as good as dead. And Abraham's just dumb enough from the human perspective to think if God could do it in that setting, he can take a boy laying dead on an altar and he can raise him up and therefore restore the promises. That's where his faith was. The impossible things are not impossible when Jehovah Jireh is our God. The other day I saw a statement that to me is just profound when we face trials. And here's the statement, you may want to jot it down, I'm continuing to think on it. Quote, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think you have been buried, but actually you've been planted. And sometimes I think the moments that we feel like things are the darkest and the dimmest are the very moment when God's about to do something great and glorious. And that's, that must be our faith tonight. Again, sometimes when we feel as if we're in a dark place, we feel as if we've been buried, when in actuality we have been planted. And God is constantly planting into our trials new growth, new progress, and doing the impossible. Now, if you will, go back to our text in Genesis 22 and look at verse 9. Genesis 22, and if you will now, verse 9. Notice how the story progresses. And this is where really the, the moment of crisis, the moment of no turning back begins to happen. Verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. And visualize this in your mind if you're even able to do so tonight. And bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Second number two, not only does Jehovah Jireh offer to us tried Uh, expectation. When you get on the other side of a trial and Jehovah has been the God you've worshipped and followed in those moments of trial, you'll know that your expectations are real expectations. They will be proven. They will be followed through. That's the God that comes through the other side. The second benefit of trials, meeting Jehovah, our trials, is He offers to us tried experience. Where not only we believe God and God has done something, but we were there when it happened. There's something about shared experience, that band of brothers, if you will. Many on this Memorial Day, I've talked with many who served in the military together, whether it was in active combat or just as, as uh, maybe in domestic responsibilities here in the States or whatever, but there's something about that bond in that moment. And the same thing happens in trials between us and the Lord. And Abraham and God got closer as a result of this experience they shared together. Two things I give you very quickly in this area of trials that Jehovah is a part of. Number one, it gives us experience with our families. Did you notice that, that Isaac is a willing participant? I saw the other day a picture portraying this moment, uh, an art picture 
from years ago that was highly inaccurate. Isaac was not 10 years old. Uh, he could have taken Abraham easily. Uh, he had to have been complicit. He had to have been submissive. And think about it. He's just asked Abraham, where's the lamb? And Abraham says it's coming. And all of a sudden, he's still looking and asking, wondering as he's being tied to the altar he had always seen a lamb tied to. And so there was this experience, this shared experience as a family of God about to provide in their family. I don't know if your family experiences much trial or pain together. The other day I heard someone say this, there are three levels of pain. Pain is one. Excruciating pain is the next level. And stepping uh, with your bare foot on a Lego left by your kid, that's the ultimate level of pain. And you, we've all had that. You know, oh, you know just yeah, but love that child, you know, and where is that kid? You know, as you pick up that Lego that's now sunken into the heel of your bare foot. Pain, oftentimes pain is a part of our families and our relationship with them. Yeah, the midst of this, God used this to bond these two together and to together see the provision of God in the situation. And I just encourage you tonight, I don't know what your family's going through. I'm sure it's flawed like ours is flawed. But there's nothing better than sharing together God providing for your needs. God meeting the spiritual needs, the financial needs, the physical needs that are represented, and God definitely provided for this family. Tonight we can trust He will do it in our lives as well. Now go down, if you will, to verse number 12. All right, the angel of the Lord calls unto him, and Abraham responds as he did in verse number 1, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. And here's striking this phrase tonight. For now I know, for now, this is God speaking, now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. Number two, it gives us an experience with our Heavenly Father. Now I want to ask you a question tonight. Is God, as we would say technically, is He omniscient? Does He know all things? Then why would God say here, now I know? Now I want you to think about that question for a moment before you just give a quick answer as I would do probably prior to my study tonight, for tonight. Why would God say, now I know that you love me more than you love the blessing I've given, the son I've given, the family that I've given, the promise that's connected to him? Well, do you realize tonight that God, though he knows all things, he does not personally experience all things. For example, um, God is holy, right? And though he knows all that's going on and he's going to judge all things, does he experience sin? Does he, does he get into the nitty-gritty? Does he, does he uh, get involved in those situations just to know them? There's a difference between knowledge that's more factual or, or comprehensive and a knowledge that is experiential. I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, you know, that kind of a spirit to uh, an experience. And so there's a difference. And here to me is the striking thing about this story. God says to him, I know all things, and I have now experienced that you love me. I have now experienced as Jehovah Jireh that you love me above all other things. And to me, here's what's awesome then about the trial. Could it be that our trials are actually a gift from God, a provision of God that provides a moment where we can let God experience the love that we have for him? To me, that just unlocked this passage, that principle that it is our trials that are often the greatest gifts God ever gives us. We would not know this of Abraham. God would not know this of Abraham in the experiential sense. Abraham wouldn't have known this of himself without the trial that God provided in his life. And so let me just caution you, don't see God as the provider who gets us out of the trials. He is that many times, but he's the provider that allows them that orchestrates them, that provides the setting, the backdrop upon which our faith and love for Him can be demonstrated. Now, I want to give you a quick New Testament example of that. Would you go to the book of Hebrews very quickly and look at chapter 4 and verse 15? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. And we're going to get to uh, Emmanuel, or God being with us, uh, shortly probably next year this time in our study of the names of God. But God came near us for a reason, and it's, some of it has to do with this experiential relationship that we have the privilege to have with the Lord. Hebrews chapter number 4, and if you would please, verse 15. 
After saying that we have a high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, all right, that's who we're talking about here. Verse 15, <laughs> excuse me, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God came near to us to redeem us, to deliver us, but also so that He could experience what our day-to-day -day feels like, what it feels like to be in this flesh and to be in this world. I know He was sinless, and there were some differences between Him and, and us, but there was common things. There were things He shared and experienced that we share. Now, to go to verse 16. Here's the application. Let us, therefore, come boldly, all right? The truths that have just been communicated should convey or motivate us to do this on the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so the question is, why did God become man? Why did God come and put uh, into a body that He had prepared His Son? Why did He do that? Not just to redeem us, but to relate to us. And I just find it awesome that God who provides for us allows us to be in situations where He and us can develop a uh, an empathy or an experiential kind of interaction with one another that otherwise would not be possible. What did Paul say? That I may know Him in what? The fellowship of His suffering. And so Christ came near to us. He suffered for us. And now we get to fellowship with Him when we go through trials ourselves. And there's just this cycle going on that instead of a woe is me and I'm just so miserable in my trials, I get to know God. I get to know the God who provides for me. And even He provided this trial so that I can experience His provisions more fully. And so stop with the victim mentality. You hear from me, you stop me as well. Praise the Lord that He's provided these difficult moments in life that I may know Him, and He may know me. And together there's intimacy that's enhanced in our relationship with God. So God is a provider in the trial, through the trial, even the trial itself is a gift from His own hand and heart. All right, now <laughs> go back to our text, if you will, and look at verse 13. And I'm sorry for the hacking tonight as well as this morning. Genesis 22, if you will now, verse 13. All right, so all of this comes to a head. God sees and knows that Abraham loves him, and there is this provision in the face of trial that God gives. Notice now verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Number two, God gives us provision, not just in trials, but number two, in the area of testimony. The area of testimony. Um, I, I have the privilege, my dentist loves me when I show up. Any of you have a, a, a hate-love relationship with your dentist? You're, you're not the most hygienic, or you, have, you just have dental issues, whatever. At least some of us play the victim card when we go, I don't know. I mean, I floss every day, and and why I have 50 ca you know, cavities or whatever. But anyway, I have the tendency to build up uh, you know, tartar and different things on my teeth to where they do what's called a deep cleaning. I don't know if any of you have that, where it's literally just water spraying everywhere. They put these, you know, as soon as they put the glasses on me, I'm like, oh no, here it comes again. And then they get out these grinders and water sprayer things, and it's just, and you know, just maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it feels like it's just this. And then they try to talk to me while they're doing that. Have you ever noticed that? And I'm always thinking, I'd be happy to express to you my deepest thoughts, but you've got your hand in my mouth, you've got these other you know, attachments that feel like vacuum suckers and grinders. I can't say anything. And in that moment, I can't offer anything of value communication-wise. Do you know sometimes in trials, um, really only if God is in the mix can there be any positive testimony given? And I just find it interesting. Abraham's at his low and he's at his high. Can you imagine the emotional roller coaster? I guarantee he is on empty in this moment. And all he had the strength to do was lift his eyes, and God got glory through this story. And tonight what I find interesting is God does not just provide in our trials just to get us through, but also to lift up his name for his testimony to go forth. And we see that clearly uh, described in our story. Can I give you a couple of your, <laughs> excuse me, areas of testimony that God provides when we let him be Jehovah Jireh? Number one, first of all, Jehovah Jireh offers to us testified sight. Testified sight. There is no testimony without the test. 
And God allows this test of Abraham to draw him into a closer relationship and to see things about God and to see things from God he could have never seen otherwise. Can I give you two of them tonight that we see when we let God protect his testimony? Number one, it gives us sight that has and possesses focus. Um, if you were standing in this situation or kneeling or in a crumpled heap at the end of the emotional challenges that Abraham faced, I think if we were honest, we would have been looking at everything except the Lord. Um, we'd have been looking at our son, we'd have been looking at ourselves, we have been looking at the situation, and I find in trials many times the last thing we want to do or feel like we're able to do is to look up as Abraham did. And dearly beloved tonight, can I just challenge you? God is trying to get your attention because He wants you to see Him. Do you, I, it's, there's so much pain, isn't there, and distractions and discouragement either inside or out of us, and we focus on those things, and God's saying, look at me. Look at Jehovah Jireh. See me for who I am. See what I can do. And many times our focus wanes in the face of those trials. You and I must maintain our focus upon our provider in the midst of our pain to fully see what God can do and what He can provide. Jot down the reference, John 8 and verse 56. Later look at it in your own time. But it says, Christ speaking, Abraham rejoiced to see your day, to see this day. Abraham had faith, I think, to see the Messiah, to see what God was going to do through this son. His focus was on such mo much more than just this moment. And again, he had so little Scripture. He had so little of God's revealed will to him, and yet he just had faith to see beyond the immediate circumstance. And as a result of that, God's testimony was elevated through the legacy and influence of this man. And so sight needs to be with focus, and God alone can protect that in the face of the trials we face. Go, if you will, then down to verse 14. All right, so God provides the sacrifices offered in the place of Isaac. I'm sure Isaac was more than willing to help put the animal down and light the sacrifice and applaud as something else gave its life in this situation. But notice that verse 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to the, this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Number two, secondly, gives sight in the area of our feet, our day-to-day -day focus. Now, how did Abraham see in the mount of the Lord what God did? He walked there. He traveled there. He followed the path. He followed the leading of God, and, and he put feet to his faith. Many times we sidestep, or we just stay where we're at, and we know that it's going to involve some trials and tests, but we forget it also means God's going to provide some revelation. God's going to provide something new that we don't know about Him to date, that we can only experience in that moment of His profound provision. Knowing that He saw that which is spiritual affected His actions in the physical realm. He saw God was working. He was willing to put feet to the faith He claimed to have in God. And I'm telling you tonight, loving God means acting upon the things God has revealed to you. I find sometimes our relationship with God, we're just praying. We're just reading. We're just talking about it, but we're not doing anything about it. God provides for those who are active in their faith. The book of Acts is called the book of Acts for a reason. God provided amazing sign gifts and wonders and salvations and churches and all kinds of things in the book of Acts, but they were acting. They were active in their faith, and we've lost that. And I found many times in the face of trials is when we first begin to stop that action. And so sight, vision, moves to our feet. All right, lastly, let's spend a few minutes in verse 15 that we've yet to read down through verse 18. All right, so Jehovah offers a testified sight. Number two, notice if you will now, verse 15, the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for this, because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies." Number two, Jehovah offers to us not just a testified sight. We're going to see some things. We're going to follow through with our feet upon some things. But number two, he offers to us a testified scale. It's larger, the vision, the plan, the purpose that he has for us than we could imagine prior to the trial. 
How many of you um, love to eat plain, plain, emphasis on the word plain, baked potatoes? Any of you like to do that? Any of you like me, you try to eliminate the taste of the potato with all kinds of other things, you know, a loaded baked potato? I think the potato is just an excuse to, you know, pile on things that will clog your arteries. You know, I love big old, you know, what is it, daisy, isn't that right? The dollop, you know, a big old, not a dollop, it's like a, you know, this big old chunk of, Sour cream. The other day, there was a story of a huge, uh, someone in the Midwest, this huge uh, uh, refrigerated truck that spilled over, and uh, most of it was sour cream. And they were saying there were thousands of pounds of sour cream just out on the out on the road. Too much of a good thing is too much. Now I've yet to taste too much of certain things. I'm still working at that in my life. But there reaches a point where you reach critical mass. That is not true with the Lord. What he provides is never too much. In fact, I think if we're, not, if we're honest tonight, we have such a small view and we're satisfied with so little of what God is. Have you ever thought about what God really does and could provide in our lives tonight? The victory, the deliverance, the, the, the testimony. Um, so often we settle for less and God says there's more, there's greater things that I have provided for you. And Abraham, when he walked away from this encounter with God, I find it interesting, walked away with more than just Isaac. He left with more than he came with. These promises that God is now giving at the balance of this story add to the revelation, add to his understanding of what God is going to do through his family. I may give you two of them as we finish in this area of scale as God tries to increase the scale of our faith in him. Number two, it gives expansion. Abraham received Isaac back. He also received much more from God in the area of provision and promises that God had given to him. Isaac was just the beginning of the mammoth blessings from God for Abraham. God said uh, this because of what he saw. He was now going to give to Abraham and through Abraham's seed, he was going to open the windows of heaven. What does that mean? They were closed to that point. He's going to open them. He's going to provide and he's going to multiply and use this family for his glory. One of the things that we're in right now as a church that I'll be honest with you as a pastor is just um, mind-boggling at times and overwhelming is um, our own facility and building and just the, the details of that. I've had several of you recently that have done the numbers and realized what that will cost, at least without God in some way doing the miraculous in His provision. If Jehovah Jireh is not our God, I hate to say it, we're stuck. God has to provide for us. But I'll tell you, if He is then what we can comprehend and how we think we're going to get there is small compared to the God that we serve. And that's the same in your life, in your family. God will provide, but I'm telling you, He'll do it in a grander scale. He'll do it in a greater way, a more glorious way than your mind could comprehend. And by the way, even if our life is taken in the trial, heaven, the eternity with the Lord is so beyond our minds. It hasn't entered in our heart or into our mind the things that God has prepared for us. And so Jehovah Jireh, when given our permission, will greatly exceed our expectations. He's never going to disappoint us. He's never going to fail us. All right, look at verse 18, and we're done. And in thy seed, here's where the spiritual comes in, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be be blessed. Notice this last phrase, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Number two, there's not only the scale with the expansion of God, but number two, the scale with the effect. The ripple effect of Abraham believing God and letting God prove, I am your provider, was going to have a lasting effect. And can I say tonight, Abraham's willingness to obey God and wait upon God has led to the salvation of countless, countless souls. And let's not keep it in the abstract souls like yours and mine. From his loins, from his seed, would come the Messiah, the Messiah who would be provided and through that provision that God did on the cross, not just a lamb and not just a ram, but the ultimate, final, it's finished, one-time sacrifice. God provided that through Jesus Christ. And because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son and God gave his only son and now we tonight benefit from that provision that God has offered. Do you realize the impact, the effect when God becomes Jehovah Jireh in our lives? Not just for us. I hope you're not in that mode tonight. 
but for others that know us, others that are impacted by us for generations to come. And so God is that kind of provider. Someone said this, only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, and a victim into a victory. Only God, only Jehovah Jireh can do that. As we finish tonight, I, the other day, received an email from a dear lady that uh, you would know, uh, Miss Cindy Yoder, who just lost uh, her husband a few months ago, Johnny. Many of you know him and were there, some of you even for his uh, service. But she was sharing with me, and I think I saw her share something online as well. Some of you others saw it. She was talking about how hard it's been to just process the lingering effects of losing your spouse. And one of the things that she was working through the last week or so was, um, and she, I asked for permission to share this tonight, um, is Johnny's clothing. And many of you have lost a loved one in your family. That's just a very awkward, what do you do? And she was talking through just, in all reality, she said, I, in and of myself, I cannot take care of that. Just may seem like a small detail unless you've been in that situation. Clothes that smell like him, clothes that look like him, clothes that are a constant reminder that he was there and he's no longer there as her spouse with their new baby. And I saw some good ideas and others I've heard where they'll take some of the clothing and make them into pillows or blankets, you know, where there's a lasting, productive, purposeful way to, to, to just give a remembrance to that person. I'll be honest with you, I, have, I don't know what I can do to help her. Have you ever been in that situation? Uh, you know, I'd love to come over, or I'd love to send my wife, or I'd love to do, I just, I, I want to, but I, I can't provide, I can't provide a new husband for you. I can't, I can't give you the comfort that you need and you desire, and I wish I could. But I will tell you tonight, I know a God who can. In the most intangible, deepest cravings and longings and groanings of your soul, I don't know how to meet those needs, and probably no one else in this room does, but I'm telling you, I know a God who does. A God who knows exactly what you need to hear, what you need to feel, what you need to know. And He's provided that through His Word and through His Spirit. And that God is a good God. Don't question Him. Don't run from Him. Run to Him. And see in His heart and see in His mind and in His will the things that Abraham experienced about this God. See, God longs to be your Jehovah Jireh tonight. He wants you to know and experience everything that He has promised to you but He's going to test you first. He's going to see where you look and who you lean and who you press into in those moments of trial. And if He sees you lean and look and press into Him, He's going to meet the need. He's going to provide everything you need. Tonight, the question is, will you allow God to become your ultimate provider? First of all, in the needs you sense and are acutely aware of in the seasons of trial. And number two, will you allow Him to provide for you in the areas of need for testimony? God, I, I can't get glory out of this situation. I don't see anything even positive about it, but I know you're going to do something. I know you're going to get glory. I allow that into my life. Will you tonight allow God to be your provider? Let's pray together. Lord, th thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for the joy it is to preach it. Lord, the things we have talked about are not just warm and...